Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank Mark for the very much for the acceptance of our invitation, and especially for the odd hours that he's forced to to talk to us. Thank you so much, Mark. And now, if you excuse me, I'll say a few words in Portuguese to present you to our friends. Ok, so, é um prazer receber aqui hoje o professor Mark Fernbey, com quem eu tenho tido a honra e o prazer de colaborar em uma de suas muitas áreas de interesse. E Mark é professor da Escola de Economia de Paris, vinculada à Escola Normal Superior. Ele é membro do CNRS, do Centro Nacional da Pesquisa Científica, que é o equivalente ao nosso CNPq, e também é parte do Centro de Formação sobre Ambiente e Sociedade, CERES. E você, na década, nessa década dos 10, ele trabalhou basicamente na Universidade de Princeton, nos Estados Unidos, onde ele foi professor de economia e estudos humanistas e também professor do Centro de, é, Center for Human Values. As suas principais áreas de interesse são muitas, mas eu lembro aqui Welfare Economics, é, Social Science Theory, Public Economics e Política Ambiental. Ele tem um número muito extenso de publicações, atua em vários comitês de pesquisa internacional e é um dos fundadores do Painel Internacional de Progresso Social, com a IPSP, é, que reúne cientistas sociais de todos os continentes, cerca de 300 cientistas sociais. E é, estamos muito gratos a, gratos a ele por aceitar, sobretudo sabendo que ele agora é é noite para ele, avançada e já teve um dia pesado de trabalho. Então, vamos, então, ouvir o professor falar sobre desigualdades socioeconômicas. Mark, the floor is yours. The microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elisa. And I didn't understand everything, but I'm sure you exaggerated. <laughs> um, so, let me share my screen. Um, I think this this one should be fine. Yeah. Is it appearing well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, the title is, is, uh, uh, is not exactly what uh, was advertised, but it's, this is really the same, the same topic because I would like to, to share with you um, a, a long-term research project and uh, very much look forward to... Um, your feedback, given your expertise in, in sociology. I'm an economist and I, I'm working on this project with two other economists, Javi Combo and Dennis Nauer. Um, and, um, and we are trying to introduce a better description of social phenomena in our economic analysis, um, and in including the uh, analysis of inequalities. And um, uh, it's actually a very difficult project for us. And so your, your feedback um, is likely to be very, very helpful, very important. Um, there is a paper that I can share on which my talk is based, uh, Efficiency and Equity in a Socially Embedded Economy. I had published um, earlier a, a paper that was already starting this research project. Um, it's maybe, uh, it, uh, it may be hard to find for you, so I could I could share it if you are interested. Um, and this was a paper that was uh, more directly connected to uh, philosophy and and the question of defining uh, social justice when taking account of social uh, relations. But um, it was uh, somehow the starting point of this uh, of this project. So let me right away explain what the the substance of this uh, project is. By the way, I forgot to ask you uh, how much time I should plan to speak and. Uh, you should feel free to interrupt me if you have questions, especially uh, for clarification. In general, you, we use uh, around 40 minutes to one hour, Professor, but uh, feel okay. free to... Okay, okay, good. Yeah, that should be fine. I, I don't have that many slides. Um, and so the, the general project is um, starting from dissatisfaction with uh, the, the, the main uh, state of economics as a discipline because it has developed uh, precisely as a separate discipline by looking at the economy in isolation from the rest of what happens in society and the, and the environment. And so a typical economic model is taking uh, society and the environment as, as fixed. But when I say fixed, I mean really uh, completely uh, uh, immobile and, and not doing anything to, um, 
to what happens in the in the economy. Um, this uh, goes back to a very long tradition. Maybe we could uh, trace it to Adam Smith, this idea of looking at the economy uh, separately. Even though Adam Smith himself was, was uh, concerned by looking at social interactions in, in some parts of his writings, especially the theory of moral sentiments. But, um, but somehow uh, this has developed into a tradition of building um, a lot of analysis and a lot of uh, specific models where you look at the economy and you only look at the economy and you ignore what happens uh, around the economy. Now, um, I should not give you a caricature of economics. Uh, there have been many developments that are not that uh, narrow-minded. Um, for instance, uh, looking at the, uh, the fact that um, the economy operates in the natural environment, um, you know that uh, models have been developed, especially by uh, William Nordhaus, but many followers after that, where you have a climate module that is added to the model to describe the impact of emissions on the, uh, on the climate and then the impact of climate on the economy. <laughs> An interesting uh, loop there. Um, and there is also a whole field uh, called political economy where you have a, a political game that is described in addition to, um, to what happens in the um, economy and with an interaction between them. Um, I hear some noise. Feel free to interrupt me, I said, and maybe I should pay attention to that. Is there a question? Por favor, desligue os microfones. I'm afraid there's an open mic. Okay, okay, that's fine, that's fine. It's not a big deal. Um, so so the, the environment has been introduced, the political game has been introduced, but the social interactions, which are not economic, have not been um, considered so much in uh, models where you would have uh, the, the two things, the economy and society at the same time. Um, there is, however, I should mention uh, a large field in the economic literature called sometimes social economics. Uh, there is um, an important handbook which was published, uh, I think uh, a bit more than 10 years ago. Um, and, um, and this field is, is uh, quite interesting and important and studies uh, mostly using uh, network theory and game theory, uh, interactions between people, especially in terms of adoption, the adoption of various practices uh, um, and the way in which you have uh, influences that reverberate across and, and dissipate uh, across the, the society. Um, and also you have things linked to uh, people's identity and how their feeling of an identity can influence their economic behavior. So you, you have things like that. But what uh, we feel with my uh, colleagues is that um, there is not yet something that would be a general framework, a sort of canonical way of representing things that would help us um, uh, see the, the uh, economy as part of society in a, in a nice way, in a tractable way uh, that would help uh, our, our analysis. And so, um, uh, as you can uh, guess, I, I'm sure, um, there is a, a clear inspiration here coming from uh, Karl Polanyi, um, for whom uh, the uh, economy was embedded in, in society. And, uh, and indeed, there are important insights coming from Polanyi's work uh, that we want to, uh, to, to um, follow. Um, and especially our conviction is that, um, our, our belief is that uh, studying the economy separately really misses out on very important uh, facts. And for instance, um, we can um, uh, imagine that in the model we are constructing, and indeed well, that's what we find, uh, a well-working economy uh, may undermine uh, certain aspects of society, certain social relations. Um, and that's very easy to imagine. We're not the first ones to to uh, introduce this idea in economics, and including Dennis Nauer had a previous paper that had a particular model describing that. So you can imagine where, when the economy becomes more uh, productive, people are more interested in investing their time and attention in the economy, and therefore will devote less uh, attention to, to other forms of social interactions. And this may undermine uh, community life uh, in various ways. Um, on the other hand, you may have interactions where uh, what happens in society with through, uh, for instance, moral norms or social norms 
can help alleviate some economic problems uh, when you have uh, issues like uh, public good uh, contribution problems or externalities and, and things like that. And, and Polanyi also had um, interesting views about the fact that the idea that certain things cannot really be commodified, can, cannot become ordinary goods. And he was thinking of goods that are not produced in the usual uh, way of uh, manufacturing production, uh, especially land and labor. Um, we, we will uh, find things which are a bit similar uh, in this project. It's not yet fully developed, uh, but I will come back to this idea in, um, in, in the sequel. Um, and finally, one idea that I, I believe is interesting to study, but is not yet fully um, developed again, is, uh, is that um, society may uh, somehow harness the economy to, to its social gain. So if you think, for instance, of a game where people seek social prestige or social status, um, if the economy becomes um, more productive, more um, effective, more efficient, then it may become uh, attractive to use the economy as uh, the, the field for a game of social prestige. Um, after, so you can even describe history as something like uh, there used to be a time where social prestige was acquired through um, more athletic uh, feats, like um, uh, especially a war, um, uh, war, war uh, uh, feats and, and uh, achievements. Um, and, and these more uh, spotlight achievements now are replaced by economic achievements. And so what, um, what the uh, businessmen nowadays do may look like a little bit like what the, uh, the chivalry traditions were doing before. Um, and so um, my seminar is supposed, and your uh, seminar series is supposed to be about inequalities. And I, indeed, I want to uh, put the focus on, on that in my talk. Um, and so here, what I will describe is that um, there has been a strong focus in economics about economic inequalities, precisely because of this tradition of looking at things somehow in isolation uh, in the economy. And um, what we want to do in this project is to uh, look at the interaction between uh, various forms of inequalities, and not just the interaction, but also the uh, accumulation of inequalities or the correlation between various forms of inequalities. So social status power may uh, be correlated with economic inequalities. Um, and we are devising methods to decompose inequalities into economic and social uh, components. So I was actually hoping uh, when you invited me first that I would have some uh, empirical example to uh, show you. Uh, unfortunately, it's not yet ready. So that would be for another occasion. Uh, but uh, so I will remain theoretical in this talk and talking about the method, um, but we are really thinking of, of implementing uh, that in some, uh, with some data. Um, and, and the idea that um, uh, social competition harnesses the economy, this is not yet fully in the, in the model, but as I said, maybe growth itself, uh, the acceleration of growth is partly due to the fact that social competition has uh, moved toward um, uh, to, to investing the, the field of, of the economy, right? And so that might be a, an interesting narrative to study. Um, so I would like to describe, so I won't present any formal modeling. So in economics, we, we use uh, mathematical models, but um, I would like to describe the, uh, the gist of the model that we use uh, without any equation. And so the, the framework we are thinking of uh, is to take a model of the economy and to add a social gain to it, right? Um, and so that essentially is an expansion of the model with an additional social module uh, to it. And in, in such uh, an expansion, you can imagine two channels of interaction between the social module and the economic module of this larger model. Um, the uh, first channel of interaction is through what I will call uh, the social technology I hope this uh, terminology is not too shocking. So feel free to give me feedback even on, on, on this uh, form of uh, using, using certain terms. Um, the social technology is, is the, the way in which uh, social outcomes for various individuals are produced out of the combination of their social strategies, what they do in the social game, 
as such, and their economic activities. For instance, the, 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 the amount of labor uh, they, uh, they do or the uh, goods they buy as consumers and so on. And so that, uh, so your social prestige, for instance, may depend both on your efforts to uh, appear uh, likable uh, on the, in the social game and on your efforts to, uh, to become rich because uh, then you, are, um, you gain some, some esteem or some admiration or you, you are able to, to pay things to friends and, and that may be part of how you get um, esteem. Um, and the other channel of interaction is uh, in people's uh, mind, so to speak. Um, people will have some goals uh, in their life that will mix social and economic outcomes. Uh, and so they may uh, want to pursue both um, social success and economic success to various degrees. And, um, and, and this happens in their goals in life. So it's more internal, whereas the social technology interaction was more in the social norms, in the institutions, in, in the way things work uh, outside uh, people's mind. Uh, really feel free to, um, to, to stop me if, uh, if you have um, uh, suggestions or comments along the way. Um, and so um, in, if, if you know a little bit about economic modeling, there is a tradition of economic models that describe the economy. And so somehow this tradition has um, trained um, the uh, possible families of models from the less um, uh, elegant ones. And so we have nice uh, models which describe the economy in a rather concrete way. They are not perfect, but, but they are uh, relatively tractable, uh, relatively elegant, and they have some structure that is capturing some key features of the, of the economy. So if we want to um, do something like here, introducing a social game, we would need a form of canonical social game that would describe the, the basic tenets, the basic features of social interactions so that we could add that to our, uh, to our model. And, and here, uh, suggestions are, would be very welcome uh, we've been uh, fishing around a little bit in the literature and didn't find uh, things which were super exciting. So if you look, for instance, at uh, uh, Coleman's, uh, James, James Coleman's uh, work, um, the way he describes uh, interactions actually seems to be inspired way too much by economic models. So essentially, he's trying to describe everything more or less like Gary Becker would do, uh, so more or less like a, like a market uh, interaction. Um, there is something um, that is uh, quite inspiring in the literature coming from Alan Fisk with this distinction of four types uh, of uh, social interactions, communal sharing, authority ranking, equality matching, and market pricing. Um, and um, so market pricing is, uh, is, is clearly something that belongs to the economy, but other forms of interaction actually can also uh, be part of the economy. And so it's not totally clear uh, that uh, something is specifically uh, social here. For instance, you find a lot of authoritarian uh, um, patterns in, uh, in business firms, right? And, and things like that. So, um, so it's, um, it's a distinction, it's a classification that is not so easy to, to use. It is um, not uh, formalized enough for us. So we would have to imagine a way of formalizing it. But, um, but another thing that, that bothers us is that it may be still too much uh, about resources and about the, the way resources are allocated through social interactions. Um, whereas what we are thinking about is about things which have um, not so much to do with resources, but more with social status, uh, sheer power, and things like that. Um, whereas here in this... Um, in this taxonomy, communal sharing, equality matching, and market pricing are all clearly mostly about resources. Only authority ranking, to some extent, could be uh, linked to, to things which are not directly about resources. And so um, we are a bit at a loss, if I may say. And so what we do in the, in the paper that I, I could share is um, to assume a very simple form of the social game, which would be a support game. So it's a game where everybody in the, uh, every individual or every subgroup um, in the society will direct to all other people that they can reach 
uh, will direct some action of support, which can be positive or negative, right? So uh, support is actually usually understood as something positive. Negative support means a form of aggression, right? Something that is undermining other people. Um, and so this, uh, so this, um, these actions uh, that everyone directs potentially to everyone else uh, describes um, the uh, a pattern of support. And then what happens to people will depend on how much support they receive and also on, on what they do themselves, right? Um, and so, um, and, and they can also support themselves. That's part of the, of the, of the description. Um, and, and we can imagine that uh, di different institutions will describe uh, the uh, way in which personal outcome depends on the combination, the pattern of support from the others. Um, uh, this, this way can, can take many forms. And so uh, one uh, example is uh, what we call the veto technology, where um, it's sufficient to be rejected by someone to be rejected by all of society. Right, something like that. So if you want to access there is some accumulation of support, uh, positive, negative, so net balance may determine uh, whether you, uh, you, you are successful or not in the social game. So a typical example is elections where you need the majority to be elected, but you may have a lot of uh, variations around this theme. So this is, these are very simple examples, but, and you can uh, introduce uh, many more technologies in which uh, what happens to you doesn't just depend on the social strategies of support, but also on the economic activities, right? So it, it might be that you need to, for instance, uh, work a certain amount in order to get the esteem of other people or to get some prestige or to earn a certain amount or to give certain gifts to other people and, and things like that. Right? So all of that can be described in this uh, technology. Um, now, um, this is not a description of social ontology in a very deep way. So the technology, the social technology I'm talking about here is uh, supposed to be just a description of existing institutions. And so this uh, approach is not probably uh, good so far to describe the change in institutions. It's more about describing uh, what happens within given institutions once norms and, and, and conventions are settled and things are stable. So it's more uh, this sort of uh, description of things that will happen in this model than a description of the, uh, the change, the revolution of, of institutions when, uh, when things uh, are, are uh, contested. Um, but that's the first step. And so hopefully in the next step, we'll be able to do something about um, changes in, in institutions. Um, and so um, what we uh, use as a concept to describe a state of affairs is in theory, and uh, because here we have um, clearly something that looks like a Nash equilibrium in the social part of the, of, the, of the situation. Each individual pursues its goal by uh, picking, by choosing its uh, economic activities and its social strategy, taking the other's actions as given, right? So, they, uh, so that's uh, the Nash aspect here is the, the idea of taking the other's action as given, right? Um, and so uh, that's the, the most basic form of, uh, of social uh, equilibrium. And, um, and in the economy, uh, that's where Varas uh, comes into the picture. Uh, we just assume that supply meets demand. And so we have a description of the economic model that is pretty standard in, in this way. Um, and so the combination of this, so you have uh, in, in the analysis of, uh, of social interactions, you have game theory studying Nash equilibria on one hand, and economic theory studying uh, competitive equilibria, sometimes called virus equilibria on the other hand. So we combine the two. Uh, we are not the first, I must say, to uh, combine these two equilibria. This has been done by uh, previous authors as well. So it's a variant of, um, of this uh, combination. Um, the, um, 
outcome of the of the social game here will be uh, determined by all the activities, economic and, and social. Um, and um, as I already alluded to, uh, this is a model that describes the state of affairs in a rather static way, even though, I mean, you can imagine easily that there could be time in the model, but time in such a way that people adjust uh, everything and they don't make mistakes in their expectations of what will happen over time. Right? So it's a very, very poor description of dynamic path. And so uh, we believe that um, a different model would be uh, more appropriate if we wanted to really analyze uh, dynamic path with, especially with, with a very um, troubled um, uh, changes in society or the economy. Another thing I should say is that um, this is uh, still a bit mainstream in the sense that this is a rational choice model. Individuals are supposed to pursue their goals by picking the best uh, economic activity and social strategy according to their goals. Um, but there is something that nevertheless departs quite a lot from standard economic models, which is that people's goals in the uh, economic uh, choices, so they're what we call preferences for commodities and labor and so on, these preferences here will be shaped by social influences. Because as I said, there is this interaction in people's goals between their social uh, goals and their economic goals. And so uh, the social situation will actually shape people's preferences over uh, the uh, over the, uh, the economic uh, choices. And that's something that is uh, uh, quite uh, important, maybe more important than to abandon the idea that people are rational. The idea that people are strongly influenced by what by what others by what others do, uh, especially in the social game, is probably the most important departure we need to make from the typical economic model in which people have fixed preferences that come from nowhere. Um, at least here with this model, we are able to describe social influences in a rather uh, precise way. So, especially for instance, uh, social status competition through uh, through um, a certain ostentatious uh, consumptions or things like that. This is very easy to describe with this uh, with this model. Um, I would like to to give you uh, two examples of uh, special cases of this model, um, which are um, I, I think simple in terms. Of we can tell a narrative around these uh, simple examples. So the first example is what we call the park, uh, the park case, the park example. Um, so imagine that uh, social interaction happens in a park, in a, in a sort of uh, American uh, way of life type of park, um, where and so people meet in the park on uh, on Saturday morning, and they uh, offer uh, time for chatting. So that's their social strategy. They are available uh, for chatting a certain amount of time. Okay, so talking to other people, that's the main activity. And chatting uh, stops, so there is a, a norm. Uh, chatting stops when the first individual stops uh, stops being available, right? So it's a sort of veto technology. The first person who wants to leave uh, stops the conversation and the others have nobody to talk to, right? So the, the simplest way of thinking of this model is to imagine we have only two individuals and they meet and the first one who wants to leave uh, stops the conversation. So uh, we call it the park because it's easy to imagine intuitively that there is no economic influence uh, in the uh, park interaction. The economy is happening outside the park, uh, somewhere else, and is totally separate from the social encounter in the park. And we can imagine the economy is fully efficient on its own and, and so on. Right? Um, now, the social game on its own is also efficient in the case with this veto technology. Because the person who is the first one to stop the conversation is a person who is at the best time of conversation, right? It's for him, it's optimal or, or her. It's optimal to stop at this time. And, and this individual is able to impose that on the other. Whereas the other will be, will be frustrated, but there is no way to reallocate uh, time of conversation or to change the time of conversation that would make uh, both of them better off. So, so, it, so we have a, an efficient game in the social interaction, we have an efficient economy by assumption. Um, but the point here is that the whole situation may actually be pretty inefficient, right? So it might be that the more talkative individual, the one who is frustrated, would rather be poorer and chat longer, right? Um, and so that 
suggest that uh, we could imagine having a trade where the uh, to more talkative individual would be able to pay for a longer conversation. But paying for conversation, that would destroy the nature of the conversation, potentially, right? So that would be a very different sort of conversation. And so essentially, we can imagine very easily that no trade for chatting is possible. And, and therefore, um, there is no uh, kind of economic solution to this general social inefficiency. But the inefficiency here doesn't come from social inefficiency or from uh, economic inefficiency. It comes from a lack of possible coordination between the economic sphere and the, and the social sphere. And so what we uh, think is that, in fact, uh, what uh, helps people deal with this kind of problem are uh, norms of uh, politeness. And so make an effort to stay a little longer will uh, be a bit difficult for the person who wants to stop the conversation first, but will uh, be good for the other person. And so uh, for some norms of politeness, the efficiency will actually be resolved without any transfer of resources, right? Without any economic uh, interaction. Now, um, I'll be talking a bit more uh, very soon about inequalities. So in this kind of model, what kind of inequalities do we have? So we have inequalities uh, that come from two sources. People may have different wealth levels in the economy, but also they may have different um, levels of satisfaction in the social game. Um, so there is one who has the optimal level and the other is frustrated. So this uh, creates another dimension of inequalities potentially. Right. And so you can imagine very easily with this type of model that um, the uh, preferences for time of conversation might depend on certain characteristics of the other individual. So for instance, racism is easy to describe in this model. If, you, if the one person doesn't like to talk to another person who has a different skin color, uh, then this, this more racist person is the one who will stop the conversation the first and will be the one who is advantaged because this is the one who is not frustrated by the, um, by the, the conversation stopping. Right. So this is a type of uh, very, very simplistic analysis that can be done with this, um, with this uh, simple example. The second example I want to mention is um, uh, an example dealing with uh, care, with personal care. And here we can, in our uh, type of model, we can describe a situation where care, personal care can be provided either through market services. So you hire someone or you put uh, the dependent person into an institution and you pay for that. Uh, or you can have friendly services or family services, right? So you can be taken care of by, uh, by a, a, a sibling or, a, or, or someone, an offspring or, or someone like that. And, um, and so um, in the example we build, we assume that there is some degree of conformism in society that pushes people to behave like the others, right? So if there is a norm, for instance, that... Um, the last uh, daughter of the family must take care of the elderly parents. Uh, this norm will tend to be uh, followed by many people because if you deviate from this norm, then it's considered to be, uh, to be bad, right? So, so that will push for uh, something that is, uh, as you may guess, uh, easily obtained when you have conformism. You will have multiple equilibria, right? So you can have equilibria with different norms. Uh, and it's very easy to have equilibria where uh, you have a uh, domination of market care. So it becomes the norm that you put your parents in an institution, for instance, or uh, on the opposite, it can become the norm that you, uh, that you host your parents at your home uh, after a certain age. Um, so the, those two norms can happen to dominate in, in similarly uh, situated societies just because uh, by path dependence, one equilibrium will arise rather than, than the other. But because of this conformism, you don't just have multiple equilibria, you have also typically inefficiency in the, um, in the equilibria uh, with either insufficient uh, informal care or excessive informal care. And now uh, the, it's very easy in this kind of uh, analysis to look at uh, what happens with technological progress. So if there is technological progress that lowers the cost of market care, uh, that may actually kill the equilibrium with friendly care uh, with a lot of friendly care. And actually this may produce a lot of inefficiency, right? So something in principle good happening in the economy can turn out to be very bad for the overall situation because it kills, uh, it destroys the incentives to produce, um, to, to, to provide a lot of friendly, uh, friendly care. 
Um, and finally, you can we can uh, we have looked a little bit at what happens uh, to uh, economic inequalities and how they interact with uh, with the equilibrium in this example. And so, what happens is that um, if you reduce if you have wealth inequalities and you reduce this wealth inequality by some redistribution in the economy, that will tend to increase the quantity of friendly care in the um, in the economy. Sorry, in the in the, in the society in general, uh, because the poorer individuals uh, will be able, thanks to the redistribution, to devote more resources to uh, to it, and this will shift the social norms upward. So um, there will be a, a shift, essentially initiated by the poorer individuals being less dependent on the economy, and uh, and that will uh, shift uh, everything. So um, so this is um, these are two examples of. Um, of what we can do with this um, uh, with this model, or the narratives that can be told, but these are just two two simple examples. We have a few others in the uh, in the paper, um, and in fact, we, we are a bit um, frightened by the the, the the whole range of possibilities. So this model is totally flexible to describe so many things, even though, um, and that's where your feedback would be would be helpful. Um, on the face of it, our technology, our description of the social game is very, very um, uh, rudimentary, right? So this uh, game of support seems to be very, very uh, basic, uh, maybe too basic, uh, but somehow we are able to, to describe a lot of things with it. Um, now, I would like to um, talk about uh, various things we can do with it, and then I will spend really more time on, um, on the issue of um, inequalities. So one thing we can do is disentangling uh, effects, because in this uh, model, if you change something, like for instance, we're distributing wealth uh, in, in the economy, that will have impacts through a change in prices, wages, and so on in the economy. And that's what is usually called in our jargon, uh, general equilibrium effects, right? So things that happen through economic incentives because prices change and so on. Um, and we have at the same time social multiplier effects. And these are changes in, in strategies in the social game, which reinforce one another under some uh, forms of conformism. Right? Um, and so these, uh, these two effects uh, in this model can be jointly present and disentangled in the analysis of, um, of a change. So we have an example that describes this sort of thing. So with a slightly different narrative, uh, which is not about care, but which is about more uh, just the fact of meeting people in various settings. Now, let me let me focus the rest of my talk on the, the question of uh, socioeconomic inequalities. That was the, the original title of my, of my talk. Um, so in this model, we can have economic inequalities and social inequalities, and we can uh, study a few things. So let me um, start with the question of the correlation between them. And so this model makes it um, uh, somehow uh, convenient to analyze the conditions under which the correlation between the two forms of inequalities will be positive. And the key condition uh, for that is the condition that an economic edge, so an advantage in the economic uh, distribution of resources, gives people a social edge, an advantage in the social gain. Right? And so that's really the key condition. I mean, it is not surprising. But then what we find is that um, this is not sufficient to guarantee that there will be a lot of correlation. You need something else. And you need one of these two additional ancillary conditions, at least. Um, one says that if you support others, if you are generous in your support toward others, that is undermining your own position, right? So if you give to others in the social game, somehow you deprive yourself. Um, and the other possible condition that would uh, be needed is uh, the, uh, the condition that your own position is more sensitive to your own action than the other's position. So if you, if you change your, your support, that will have uh, more impact on your own position than it will have on the other's position. Okay, so somehow you are more in control of your own position than you are uh, in control of the other's uh, position through your social strategies again. So these uh, these two ancillary conditions, we didn't really expect them. I'm not sure it's a deep discovery, but 
uh, they reflect possible institutional features. And so uh, especially um, you can imagine conditions where these conditions would not be satisfied. Uh, so institutions where social success is actually boosted by generosity toward others, right? So if you support others, then you become a hero. Uh, that's uh, something that um, is, uh, is, is, is going in the, uh, potentially in the other uh, direction. And uh, when generosity is super effective, uh, so when you help others, then they, they become uh, stars in the social game, uh, then is, is also something uh, that will uh, that will go against these conditions. And so um, that may help us reflect about the kind of institutions that could reduce the correlation between economic inequalities and social uh, inequalities. I mean, this is sort of um, very preliminary analysis of that, and I guess um, much more could be done, but that's what we have so far on this front. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is the following. This may be... Um, uh, I'm not sure it's very important, but it's it's quite striking in this kind of model. Um, seeking economic inequality, uh, sorry, seeking to reduce economic inequality uh, may be problematic. Um, and so the, the idea here is that, I mean, this, this may sound shocking because we are very used to saying that economic inequality is the source of a lot of problems, and so we should really reduce it. But in fact, uh, this would neglect something, which is that people may give different weights to economic and social success in their lives. And so if you have heterogeneous goals in life in the population, uh, it may be inefficient to seek to reduce economic inequalities across people, even when this uh, effort to reduce economic inequalities is restricted to people having the, the same social status. So it's hard to explain that without without having a, a, a formal description of the, of the analysis. But, um, but this relates to a classical result that I, I've been familiar with um, for many years in, in the field of fair allocation, which is that if you seek equality in several dimensions, when people have different priorities, uh, this may be problematic because this may fail to respect their uh, different uh, goals in life. And, um, and thus, uh, what happens is that if you want to assess inequality between people, you should not just track the dimensions of life, you should also look at the fit between their situations and their individual values, their goals in life. Right? Um, and so it's, maybe it's intuitive to see that a situation in which a greedy person, a person who really wants to have a lot of economic success, if this person is rich and unpopular in the social game, Whereas uh, while uh, an artistic person is poor, uh, but popular in the social game, this situation is better than the opposite combination, right? It's better than the situation in which the greedy person is poor and popular and the artistic person is rich and unpopular, right? Because their goals in life are better satisfied somehow with this type of inequality than with the other uh, type of inequality. And so that means that uh, inequalities, um, uh, should depend on people's values. And that leads me to uh, the main proposal of the paper regarding inequalities, which is that we should measure inequalities um, in socioeconomic terms, in a, in a synthetic way, looking at the two dimensions at the same time. And so the proposal is, we make a very specific proposal to do that, which can be implemented. Um, the idea is to uh, still use a monetary measure or an economic measure of inequalities, but one that takes account of the social aspect of people's life. And so uh, concretely, or more precisely, the idea is to measure people's situation by the level of economic resources that associated with the ideal social standing according to their own views would give uh, them a situation that is as good as their current situation. Okay, so it's a bit uh, of a mouthful, but you have, imagine you have a particular situation. You could have another situation where an ideal uh, social standing, an ideal social success uh, as, you, as you see fit, but with a different amount of resources, right? And so when would you be indifferent between the two situations according to, law, to your life goals? Uh, you would be indifferent for a certain level of economic resources in this hypothetical situation with ideal social standing, right? And so that level, will be the, the thing that will serve as a measure of your 
overall situation. And you see, it's a measure of the overall situation because it takes account of people's goals in life and the degree of priority they put between the two, uh, the two dimensions. And so it somehow it takes economic living standards and corrects that for the gap between the current situation and the ideal situation in, uh, in social uh, standing. Sorry for the typo here, the ideal situation. Um, and um, okay, and so um, this measure has a name usually in the literature that it has been uh, used. And I myself worked uh, in applications of, of this measure. It's called equivalent income, but, um, but that's, um, so it's not, we are not really innovating here. The only innovation is to uh, apply that to the socioeconomic uh, analysis. And a, a last thing I would like to mention uh, along the analysis of inequalities is the idea that we can do something that economics has not been very, has not been very good at uh, analyzing, namely Faustian bargains in the economy. And I'm thinking mostly of the labor market as the main illustration of Faustian bargain. So the labor market has been viewed in many different ways in the in economic analysis. So if you go back to, to Adam Smith, um, I'm sure you are familiar with the, um, with the invisible hand of Adam Smith, which is about uh, people's incentives. But there is another uh, invisible hand in, uh, in the theory of moral sentiments. Adam Smith says that consumption is much less unequal than wealth, thanks to the fact that the rich want to hire the poor. And so by hiring the poor, they will pay a salary and that will reduce the inequality in consumption compared to the initial inequality. Right. Um, and so it's a sort of very rosy view of what happens thanks to the labor market. Uh, of course, Marx had a less uh, rosy view, uh, seeing exploitation through an unequal exchange of labor value. And he also had uh, something that was not developed very much in economic modeling, but which is uh, the idea that domination happens through the uh, exchange uh, of services in the labor market. And then you have neoclassical economics, where um, uh, I think essentially uh, the labor market is viewed as a place where you have mutually advantageous trade between employers and employees. Um, there may be inequalities and they may be problematic, but the inequalities that uh, this uh, branch of economics focuses on are inequalities in productivity. So some people have low wages, other people have high wages, and this is, uh, this is a problem. Um, but but this is essentially this is all the type of inequalities that people look at in the labor market. And so what's missing here, but is is was there in Marx's uh, theory of domination, is that what happens in the labor market is an exchange of resources on the one hand versus time and status on the other hand. Not just time, but also status, because when you become an employee you change your status with respect to your employer, you become dependent, you, you become subservient, you have to obey your employer. And that's this idea of obedience is actually coded in the labor law. And so um, even if uh, this trade is mutually advantageous uh, and transfers resources from the rich to the poor in some way, uh, at the same time, it increases social inequalities, right? So you may have two independent people. If one hires the other, uh, the status is uh, become unequal. Um, and, and that's something that is a sort of Faustian bargain. So when you become a, a salaried worker, you trade uh, your dignity for, uh, for your salary. Well, that's the, the story. And so this model is very convenient to describe this, uh, this situation. As I already alluded to in the beginning, we can, now that we have, uh, once we have a measure of people's situation that uh, summarizes both their economic and social success. Uh, so this uh, equivalent income measure, we can decompose inequalities. So you take a measure like the Gini coefficient or something like that of inequalities of this measure, and you can decompose it into the various um, components of people's um, index of uh, overall success. And, and in particular, uh, in the paper, we describe how to do it in terms of all these components. So first, economic inequalities, second, social inequalities, but then you have all the things that you can distinguish. You have the correlation between economic and social standing that adds to the inequalities because the positive correlation means that the poor people, they uh, accumulate difficult disadvantages on the economic and on the social uh, front. And um, in addition, you can also introduce a component that comes from the fact that people have different values in life. So the fact that they wait 
social and economic standing differently is itself a source of inequalities. And finally, there is the correlation between values and individual situations. I uh, mentioned that when I was talking about the greedy, unpopular person. Um, so this correlation, depending on how it turns out, may increase or decrease uh, inequalities. Um, one thing that um, we are encountering now that we want to implement this methodology and, and uh, uh, do some empirical analysis is that there are certain uh, things that we have in the data which are not easily classified as economic or social, and especially health is something that is a personal um, element of people's situation that is super important, um, but it's not exactly an economic uh, characteristic, and it's not exactly uh, a, a social uh, standing uh, thing either. It's somewhere a little bit in between. Um, so maybe we should keep it independent, but we are not quite sure what to do with this uh, these features of people's situation, which are, are a bit outside of this simple uh, dichotomic, uh, dichotomous um, taxonomy. Okay, and I think this is my almost last, uh, last slide, uh, my two last slides. So um, what we would like to do in future projects, so we have started looking at uh, the esteem game in more detail. Uh, so the esteem game is a situation where your actions are observed by other people and they may affect the way they treat you. So that can be done for individuals, and that's what we've done in the first paper, but it can be done also for firms. So if firms, for instance, exploit their market power or pollute too much, that can influence the demand to, their, to these firms or the willingness of the workers to work in these firms. Um, and that's so the, the esteem gain uh, can have an importance in the, in the economy as well. So essentially boycotts can be described in this, in this uh, type of approach. Um, and, and the esteem game is quite interesting because it um, uh, highlights the importance of information and transparency, right? So the more we know about people's uh, situation, uh, the more we can play this esteem game. And somehow uh, some people say, and I, I think we could describe that in this approach, the fact that social media now uh, give a lot more transparency to people's situation. People describe themselves a lot more through social media uh, this creates, this, this uh, exacerbates the social competition between people. So somehow the esteem game now is, uh, it's the light game in, in, uh, in social media uh, is becoming very uh, kind of very fierce, even sometimes violent for, for people. Um, okay, and, and so, and then uh, we can, with this, we can describe a, a variety of incentives that motivate people. So people may do things because they, immediately enjoy them or directly enjoy them, or because that gives them self-esteem or because it corresponds to their moral principles or because it gives them social reputation. So this, this esteem game is, um, is, uh, is convenient to describe these various incentives. Um, another project we have is uh, to build a general model of social interaction. So um, I've been talking about seeking a canonical model, but what we wanted was to describe uh, just what happens in the social game in the non-economic part of social interaction. But what would be nice would, have, would be to have a, a more ambitious project where you have a general model of social interactions where market interactions become a subcase, a special case of interactions. And you could imagine describing what happens when people decide to use the market or not to use the market for certain types of interactions. And that's where uh, you can really analyze the scope of commodification in society. Uh, and in particular, I'm very interested in the story that uh, beliefs and values, including esteem, cannot be traded, right? So you cannot pay someone to be loved, for instance. That's impossible because love is not something that people can force themselves to have just by being paid to have it. Um, and so that limits the, the scope of markets. Um, but, but essentially, we could look at other features of markets. I mean, markets are, are an interesting um, type of interaction, which is sort of low interaction, low temperature interaction. So it, it's better than fighting for resources, but it's less good than generosity and friendship and, and communal sharing, right? Um, and finally, um, yeah, this is my last slide. Um, the, um, um, I, I'm a bit um, unsure about how you receive this, uh, this kind of talk because I'm not trying to really explain um, facts in uh, coming from data observed in the world. This is more about uh, trying to um, 
to help understanding possible mechanisms, right? To build a structure of thinking, a conceptual structure that could help us understanding certain mechanisms, and also to provide normative guidance for inequality measures, right? So this idea of measuring uh, people standing in, with equivalent income, that's a normative approach, and uh, whether it is uh, relevant is, is really a, a question of value judgment. And, and we hope that um, uh, this approach may help change a little bit uh, people's uh, approach to the world, uh, especially through uh, teaching this type of model. I mean, you know that economists are uh, going through a curriculum where they start with a description of the perfect economy, and then they learn about imperfections in the economy. And so somehow what we hope to do with this model, and we have some colleagues who have uh, adopted it already uh, somehow in their, in their teaching, is to completely change the perspective by saying what's more important, the, the prime uh, pattern in social interactions is this interdependence between people that is very strong and is happening in the social game primarily. And then market relations are somehow a little thing in that, in that uh, large uh, set of, of interactions uh, and is not the central story, right? So market interactions are, are a special and not maybe not the most important type of interaction. Um, and so, so that, um, of course, changes completely the picture because it gives you a much more um, pessimistic view about the possibility of the social system to work very well. Uh, the strong independent interdependence we have uh, 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 one another um, is something that makes us super dependent on, on negative uh, phenomena happening in the social interaction. Um, and so it's unlikely that uh, an optimum will uh, naturally emerge. And so we have to, to think about institutions and norms and so on uh, very carefully if we want uh, something like that. Um, okay, maybe I should stop here and um, uh, leave time for questions. I'm afraid I've been, uh, I've been too long. I've, I've spoken for uh, 15 minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it was great. Uh, we have already received a, a pair of questions, and I would ask if I can read the, the first ones, and then uh, I pass the word to Professor Elisa, and then she... Maybe you can answer both uh, questions, and then we open uh, again to the the uh, questions that may arrive. Uh, first, the one that we received by the YouTube uh, broadcasting, uh, Fabio Waltenberg, he asked, uh, to what extent your approach differs from economics of identity? Mm -hmm. uh, example, Akaroff and Cranton who also used conventional economic models integrating identity, role models, norms, etc. And uh, to what extent your approach differs also from social preferences approaches, such as uh, from behavioral economists, Fur, Schmidt, Rabin, Levin, who model agents whose economic choices depend on frustration, compassion, Envy, anger, despise, etc. And then, uh, Elisa? Uh, perhaps Marx wants to answer that because I'm going to make more general comments. It's up okay. to Okay, as you like, yeah. I, I, can, I can be um, uh, not too long on the first uh, question, indeed. Yes, so th these are good questions. So I, I, um, I was not very, I did mention the identity approach in the beginning of my talk. Um, but indeed, um, so I guess the the the, the identity uh, economics uh, literature is um, uh, super interesting and, and helpful to this project. Um, what we are trying is essentially just to supplement this project in a way by uh, looking for a sort of canonical framework that would encompass that and possible other things, right? So what you find in the literature on identity economics is many nice examples. Um, what is still uh, missing is a sort of uh, canonical structure that would encompass uh, everything. And uh, so we have something like that for economic models. Um, I mean, it's not totally true anymore because now there is such a variety of economic models, but at some point there was something like that that was the general equilibrium model. Now it's more complicated. Um, 
but somehow what we are trying to do is the equivalent of general equilibrium for the for the socioeconomic interactions and that's not really what we find in the literature uh, the literature on social preferences is also indeed uh, potentially inspiring uh, what happens here but it is more about describing uh, what uh, how people uh, feel and how they incorporate inequalities in their own um, in their own goals in life in their own feelings um, then again then then uh, embedding that in a general model that covers all aspects of interaction so that's uh, that's the way in which we see um, the the difference but somehow it's uh, it's not in competition it's uh, just a way of trying to accommodate all of that in the same model if we could maybe it's too ambitious but, uh, but that's the idea Okay, so I go for my general comments. I do think it's very different from the economic models that I know because I, I can relate on so many issues you mentioned. I need to reflect more. My comments are dispersed because I was uh, excited that with different things. So, but basically, I would start saying that uh, you mentioned Polanyi as kind of a inspiration for embeddedness. But I do think there is a a significant difference. Mm -hmm. um, Polanyi thinks of society um, as the equivalent of the market. That is the invisible hand of society. Uh, when things are going bad, society automatically has some mechanisms to redress it. Doing that, uh, he kind of does not account for individual choice. I think your model is much more individualist, although contemplate interactions. Now, what I think could be interesting to add is to take, it's to think of power as a different ingredient. Because in a way, I, as much as I sense it, you, are, you try to accommodate power in institutions. But there is more to it than institutions. There is volition. I mean, if you are thinking about individual preferences, some people uh, have more resources to exert volition. And I think you should perhaps accommodate power in your model. You already have norms and values. Norms and values, in a way, connect uh, the society and power, but it's different. If you think of... I mean, because I think your epistemic status is actually some form of basic science. And I like it very much because, I mean, people think of the usefulness of social science always related to applications. But without um, the basics, you cannot think of applied economics in a fertile way. So in order to, to make this epistemic status more powerful, I think you need to incorporate power. Because otherwise you are do, dealing with volition, with motivation, as it was it, it was equal to every for everybody, except by uh, different amounts of resources. So power is a different kind of resource. That's what I would like to say. Yeah. Um, shall I answer? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Elisa. And I I, uh, I hope we have a. Uh, uh, the occasion to have a longer conversation. Um, so regarding Polanyi, you, you may be right, even though, uh, as I remember, um, it's uh, some years now I have read this book, but um, he did, it does describe the, the way in which society, um, for instance, helps the poor in various uh, traditional institutions. Um, so it's true that it's, it's not exactly described in terms of individual strategies, uh, but nevertheless, it's not as if it was a sort of automatic thing. Uh, is is really looking at the way in which uh, certain institutions work in certain contexts and fail to work once, for instance, the economy takes off and undermines uh, the working of these uh, traditional uh, institutions. So, um, so somehow we should, um, uh, I don't think we should see ourselves as in competition with Polanyi, but more potentially as, as being able to describe some features of what he, he describes, um, especially the, the possibility that solidarity at the communal level can be undermined by the development of the economy. Um, mm -hmm. Now, regarding power, I, I fully agree with you. Um, the, 
the model itself, uh, the general structure is uh, compatible with the description of power that would be relatively explicit with, we could describe people giving orders to others. So when I said it's a game of support, I was a bit um, too narrow because that's uh, how I like to interpret the model, but the same model can describe a situation where um, individual one gives orders to individual two, and these orders force individual two. I mean, in a way, it's change. It's going. It goes through the technology of uh, of the social standing in the sense that if individual two disobeys, then something bad may happen in the in the social outcome for this individual. Right, um, and so somehow we can describe something like that. But I, I fully agree, and uh, we we are um, we have been thinking about that that um, it, it, it is still lacking a sufficient um, preciseness, precision in the description of power mechanisms mm -hmm. and the way in which power can be shifted from people to people. Um, so, but I would like to have a longer conversation with you about the difference between institutions and other things like volition and this sort of thing, uh, because it's not clear to me exactly where, where we should go on this front. So um, I'm not sure I fully understand what you have in mind. Okay, send me the paper. I'll be glad to read the paper. Mm -hmm. Before Rogério speaks, I would ask Mark if you could uh, maybe send us the link to the paper so that we can share not only in the Zoom platform, but also in our uh, broadcasting in the YouTube. Ah, oh, so if you want possible, me to do if that? possible. Yeah. Right now? Um, okay, um, how can I do that? Um, and then Rogério speaks. <laughs> okay, let me try. I try to listen and to do that at the same time. Oh, okay, you, know, you can send us uh, via email if you want to. I think it's easier, isn't it? It, it? it doesn't have to be right now, actually. Oh, okay, okay, that will be easier. Thank you, because yes, I have to yes. figure out what, where, then we what add is the best the, thing. We can add a comment to the YouTube uh, okay. channel or okay. something like that. So I'll send okay. you the two papers, actually, if you don't mind, because I'd be happy to, uh, to have feedback on the first paper as well. Hmm. Okay. Well, I, I found your work very, very exciting and very revolutionary, I, I, if I can say, but also very difficult to, to grasp because you are trying to make a bridge between the two disciplines uh, in a way which is very, very original. But it, it, it raises some questions like... I, I was not particularly uh, convinced about how social status or social inequalities in general translate into a, a income scale of uh, a, a, a equivalent scale, because uh, social uh, social inequalities are, they are multidimensional. You can think about. Uh, uh, the, the hierarchy between people in a family, like uh, the gender inequality uh, in the most part is, it, it happens within the households, not between households. And, and the, 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 how the labor uh, is divided between husband and wife is very uh, different between, uh, I, I don't know. And there is, there's also among friends, uh, uh, within organizations, and we can think about social inequalities in a very broad way. So uh, which kinds of social inequalities can be translated into a equivalent scale of income? This is, I, I think, I, I don't know. Uh, this is the first question. I have the second question, uh, three questions actually. Uh, the second question is about the idea of social and economic, uh, the social sphere and the economic sphere being different. Uh, the first question is, are they actually separated in order to be um, there, there, there to act, to exist? They need to join them again. I mean, why do a people? Why do a person want money? Uh, I don't. Uh, the, the objective can be social status. I mean, a person can uh, uh, be greedy because he, uh, he wants to influence politics or to have influence uh, in a local economy or so on. Uh, in other words, we can actually uh, make a, a social utility scale in which the, 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 the willing to be influenced or to be powerful is the metric. So having money 
it does not uh, have just a, an influence on well-being, but uh, how a person can be influenced on some uh, in some place. So we can actually invert the priorities, uh, making the social uh, scale to be the first one or the uh, or the objective. So if we do that, we uh, there, there is no difference between social uh, and economic spheres, right? Uh, I mean, the idea that the, the economy is different from the society is the, uh, it, this the division is it, it comes up from a literature, the social economically uh, the uh, uh, the the economic sociology of the. 50s, I mean, I, I don't know, Parsons and the others thought, thought about the economy uh, as being separated from the society. And Polanyi uh, responds to, 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 to this debate, right? But the new economic sociology that born uh, that uh, that it starts with Renovetter uh, at the eighties, uh, it's it's very different from the first one. The new economic sociology thinks about economy as being part of the uh, of the social sphere, right? So there would be no difference between these two uh, these two spheres, and no need to join them again because there was no separation at the start uh, from the start. This is the second question, and the third one is. Um, one of the very uh, important things to this new economic sociology is about preference formation. So you you thought uh, you you talked about that uh, when you uh, that the slide of the nation Walras uh, equilibrium, but um, you left that uh, aside from your model uh, as far as I understood because I I I don't think I figured out everything you said. But anyway. Uh, the idea that people have uh, predefined preferences that do not change during the interaction uh, is very uh, is the very basis of the atomic uh, the atomistic econo uh, economy, right? The the the, the main problem uh, of the uh, the neoclassical economic model, according to the sociologists, is the atomism. Is the idea that people are uh, uh, created isolated and then put into interactions, bringing the, their preference to the interaction. And they their payoffs according to this predefined during the, the during the act action is unstable according to zoom uh, according to the uh, to this this economic sociology the problem is that during the interaction people learn and they change their 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 preferences and couldn't it be interesting to uh, to uh, uh, endogenize the preference to make the preference endogenous to the model in order to 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 see how people could think differently or change their preference or change their goals uh, during the course of action. I, I don't think that is possible, but I, I, I don't know how that could be possible, but I think that's the core of the critics from the new economic sociology. Okay, that's it. I was muted, sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Rosario. Rosario. Um, uh, yeah, so let me address them in order. So the, the equivalence approach actually is precisely designed to tackle multidimensionality. Um, but the way it does that is, um, oh, it, it looks like we've lost uh, Roger, you right? No, no, I'm here. Oh, no, I'm you here. are here. Sorry, I was, uh, yeah, I, was, I was not finding you in the, in, on the screen, sorry. Um, so, so the way it does, it does that is to, uh, is by uh, relying on, uh, on people's own uh, values and preferences, right? So, um, and so the idea is that people um, are supposed to be able to, to weight uh, the relative importance of uh, what happens in terms of social success or whatever uh, in the family with friends, with uh, uh, colleagues and so on. And so all of that together, they are able to make trade-offs uh, and to decide what they consider to be more important. Um, and, and that's how you compute this equivalent income, right? So people uh, essentially designing for themselves the optimal mix of success that they want to have in their family, with their friends, their community, their work, and so on. Um, and so, um, so I, I think in terms of the structure of the approach, it's precisely 
um, designed to deal with multidimensionality and transform everything into one dimension. Now, of course, you may be a bit worried that the preferences that will do this job, right, the, the weights that people have, may not be fully trustworthy. Maybe they are actually uh, shaped by bad social conventions. Uh, and so we may be worried that uh, the way in which they, for instance, they may fail to give sufficient importance to the quality of social relations because they have acquired too materialistic consumerist uh, way of life, right? Or something like that. And so, so that we can, but, but the approach is flexible so that you can say, instead of relying completely on people's own uh, values, we can correct these values. And we, we might want to, to have a sort of paternalistic approach saying people are wrong uh, and, and we can uh, use a better approach than them in order to evaluate their situation. So the approach is structurally very flexible. Um, and, um, and, and these are possibilities. Now, regarding the separation of spheres, um, yeah, so I, I think that what we are trying to do is exactly what you recommend, which is to really uh, have a, a way of describing the economy as being part of the social game, right? Um, but nevertheless, it is specific in the sense that we have we already have some models to describe the, uh, the interactions that take place through the market and through, through economic uh, forms of interaction. And so we keep that. We don't want to just destroy that and say, oh, let's put everything in the social game. Um, so we keep that, but then we, we embed that in the social game. And so people will pursue their social strategies, including through uh, their economic activities, right? And so I think it's exactly what you were uh, describing. Uh, that, that's exactly our goal, and that's what the, the model is, um, is able to do, and is able to do through, as I said, these two uh, channels of interactions. One is that your social status, your social success may depend on your economic activities. So you may decide, for instance, to take a certain job because it gives more prestige than another job. That's totally uh, feasible in, in, this, um, in, uh, in this model. Um, and also in, in people's uh, own values right so they may have um uh they may have uh, personal goals or preferences that really uh, uh, combine these two things um and so it may be for instance that um the way in which they uh value uh, certain types certain way of life uh, depends very much on the kind of friends they have right and so so this is this comes from uh, the um the fact that they uh, are their values are strongly uh, linked to their social interaction. And that leads me to the third point, uh, preference formation. I think a lot of that is actually described by this model. So um, this, this uh, uh, is because um, the way in which we describe people's um, preferences is, I mean, we, so in a way we assume a, so, a form of atomism. Uh, I should be frank about that. There is a form of atomism, but the atomism, so, so people have fixed preferences in the model, but fixed preferences over everything at the same time, including what happens, everything that happens in society. And so that means that there are preferences over any subcomponent of the situation, especially the component that relates to their own situation, may be completely dependent on what happens to the rest of society, right? And so, People may become, for instance, materialistic and consumerist if the rest of, of society is like that, or they may become more um, uh, frugal and environmentally interested if the rest of society is like that and so on, because they, their um, preferences will depend on the whole uh, situation in the whole society. So, um, so we have a paragraph in the paper explaining that, that um, even though the formal description of the model looks very much like the classical thing where people have well-defined preferences and the, you have the objects of preferences, which are this and that. In fact, um, these objects can actually represent things that shape people's preferences on the rest of, of the objects of their lives, right? Um, and so this, uh, this model can describe something that's not atomistic at all, which is very uh, social connect, socially connected uh, and where people's uh, preferences over their situation their personal social situation, their personal economic situation, very much depends on social influences. So I th that, that's something I like about this model. We are really going very much in that direction. What this model doesn't do, though, is to abandon uh, the idea of rational choice. So people still maximize in this model, 
they still do the best uh, according to uh, uh, to what they think fit for uh, for themselves and, and the rest of society. Um, that that's a feature that is um, in a way chosen in order to be able to uh, not just to relate to the state of the literature in economics, where this is really a, a kind of a cornerstone, but also because we would like to see how far we can go by retaining this feature and still incorporate a lot of things like precisely the um, the social influences on preferences. But yeah. thank you. These are these are great questions. Very very uh, very spot on. Yeah, really. Uh, Anna Colaris that uh, asked us for. Okay. Uh, thank you for the. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the, the very interesting talk. Um, I just, uh, the question I had, mostly you sort of answered them in the last uh, explanation of Rogerio's uh, question, but I still wanted to see what you would say about it. I was, uh, the first I was wondering how health would fit in your model and you said health is not uh, completely economic, not completely social, but you also have like some, some behaviors related to health and to environment, for instance, that would be like, for instance, uh, deciding to vaccinate, not for personal reasons, but for the public good, or uh, deciding to take public transportation instead of buying an SUV or things like that, that, uh, I don't know, social Darwinist theory would fit this into the altruism, altruistic behaviors, like you decide to reduce your offspring to allow for the, for the existence of other uh, species. And I wonder just how you would uh, think this fits, this kind of questions uh, fit in, into your theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it, it would not be too difficult to introduce uh, the environment as an additional element of the model. It would complicate things, but, uh, but that's not, not super uh, difficult. Um, and in fact, in the next uh, paper that we are preparing, there is something a bit like that, where we, we allow for uh, economic externalities on other people, and that can be through pollution and, and things of that sort, right? Um, so, um, so in a way, that's uh, the next model rather than this one, uh, because in this one, uh, what happens is that we have chosen uh, to have to keep an economy that is um, that is free from uh, basic failures, so no public goods, no externalities, and things like that in the economy, in order to see what happens when we just introduce the social interactions, the social game, social prestige, social status, and, and so on. Um, and, and so, um, so what you describe is, uh, is really very much, uh, at the center of what we want to do in the, in the next paper, where we'll have public goods and externalities and, and, uh, externalities coming from individuals, coming from, uh, firms, uh, and so on. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, this is, uh, this is super, super important because, um, uh, indeed, as you said, uh, people may be motivated to um, to do things which are good for the rest of society uh, for various reasons. And um, and as I said, so I, I was talking about the esteem game at the end, where people may have different motivations. And so people may, for instance, take public transportation because they like it, or because uh, they feel it's better for according to uh, moral principles or the environment, or because uh, it's a social norm. Uh, it's uh, there is a social uh, shaming if they take uh, their car or something like that. So, so all of that can be described in the in the model. Um, uh, sorry, in the next model with the esteem game. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, for health, I was hoping that someone would give me the solution. Can, can we consider health as a as something that's neither economic nor social, or what, what should we do with it? Both. For sure, <laughs> but uh, I, I found very interesting your presentation, Mark. Uh, ah, uh, talking about the Steam game that you said, I, I would just put a small question, a very simple one, uh, about uh, you mentioned that you would like to use uh, social media as a source of data and. Uh, I am a little cautious about the use of social media because of the the bias and the uh, all the the uh, not instrumental use, but all, only uh, in a way of exposure of uh, uh, some fragment of life. And anyway, 
uh, it's just a, a little doubt. Uh, but uh, the question I would like to ask, uh, really, is, and maybe we are going to uh, go to the last part of the presentation, as we are used to remain around one hour and a half, uh, I would just like to ask about, uh, as uh, in Brazil, uh, your book that you, Elisa, and the others organized was uh, released uh, some few months ago, uh, the, and, uh, the translation, ah, I have to change my... Ah, yeah, it's uh, no. fuzzy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And the Manifesto for Social Progress, uh, oh, great. I, would, uh, I would like just to ask about uh, how you, oops, uh, how you, you change it from uh, the trajectory uh, uh, from this book, uh, from your, the panel uh, that you belong, you both belong, and uh, to this project now. Uh, it, was it influenced by the results that you collected the data among all your research that uh, was Herculeus? Oh, so uh, this is the final question, and then you feel free to final considerations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mario. Um, yeah, about social media, right? I was just taking that as an example. Uh, you're right that it, the, the point is not to claim that uh, it, uh, it's, um, we, we'll give a full representation of what happens there. But what I, I've read in some places, I don't remember where, is that social media have increased certain forms of social competition by increasing visibility. And, and that's the phenomenon that's very easy to describe in our, um, in our model. So that, that's the, the thing I wanted to mention. So this is just um, an example to illustrate the what this model does. So yes, uh, you're right. Um, and I was happy to see the, to see the book. Yeah, and, and thank you. Yeah, again, uh, let me, really I was uh, just uh, passing the, the, to expose the, as it, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the cover. And, and, and many thanks to Elisa, I think who was really instrumental in, in making it happen. Um, yeah, so, so this, uh, this um, work that we did together uh, with Elisa and many others in the panel, uh, indeed, uh, was very influential uh, for this project uh, and was the occasion actually to interact also a lot with my co-authors in this project. But um, the, the interaction we had in the panel was a lot of disciplines from social sciences and humanities. And, and in the, if you read the big report, uh, not just the small book, but the, there is a big report in three volumes that we, we wrote with many, many uh, authors, more than uh, 250. Um, and... Um, so social interactions are super important in there in various ways. So there are governance power issues, there are social values and uh, cultural issues and so on. So a lot of a whole range, much uh, richer than what I, I described in my little uh, talk here. Um, but but uh, this made it uh, very vivid to me, something that I had been thinking about for years before, which is that our models are very poor on the description of this. And it's really a pity. And, and the interaction uh, in the panel made convince me that this was a kind of emergency, that uh, what we are telling in our economic models that are separated from the, 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 the embeddedness of, in society uh, is completely missing super important facts. And so especially this idea that um, instead of viewing, and I've been myself teaching economics for many years now, um, and I've participated in this tradition of saying, okay, there is the economy and then you have things happening around, so market failures, externalities and things like that. I think this is a completely a wrong vision. It's the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the interdependence is the first thing. And then you have certain solutions here and there which happen in different ways. Market interactions can be one solution in certain contexts. Other interactions are other solutions, but externalities are the, the main, I mean, interdependence is the main fact. And then uh, you deal with it in various ways. But uh, um, so somehow the, the framing of economics has been very wrong in trying to uh, imagine that uh, we are more independent than we are, uh, more independent from one another than we actually are. I'm not sure it's a 
full answer to your question, but yeah, it was, it was super inspirational for me. Mm. Yeah, and here in Brazil, we have a tradition that inequality was uh, first an issue for uh, the scholars from the economics, and then just uh, some years later, the social sciences uh, embraced the inequality as a study, uh, object of study, and so your your proposal dialogues a lot of our tradition of study of uh, inequality that uh, is, uh, is one of the others. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so, uh, okay, so if, if I understand, Elisa was, uh, was a pioneer uh, because she, she has studied inequalities yeah. for many years. Yeah. <laughs> well, if okay. there, uh, there is no one more wants to speak, we would like to thank you again, Mark. Uh, it was really a pleasure for us to listen to you. And, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I'll send you the papers and feel free to uh, reach out if uh, if you want to continue the conversation because I, I find it super helpful. Thank you very much, Mark. It was great. Have a good night. Sleep well. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.